We are so happy that you're joining us today for worship. Our prayer is that you and your family would find a place to connect here at Welcome. right before he is crucified for our sins, uh, which I just, it's so powerful that as he was in the cross, or he, as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, um, he wasn't praying that God would make, you know, his coming trial easier or uh, less difficult, but he was praying for you and for me. Um, and it just, it's just so beautiful that that's what was on his mind right before he died for us. Uh, so go ahead and follow along. Uh, Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Well, greetings again, everybody. I am very appreciative of you coming out on a beautiful, nice, sunny New Year's Day, right? Nice and warm and toasty. A week ago, on Christmas, it was about 70 degrees. I was wearing a t-shirt and shorts, and here we are today, and it's just nasty. Um, what we have today, uh, I've titled our sermon as War. And that brings a lot of different images to your mind. And probably think, and you may think about all the different uh, sort of conflicts we've had going on um, all over the world. We think, about war, we think about all these places in the Middle East that are just in all sorts of tyranny and there's all sorts of conflict. But more than that, you might think about the wars that we got to watch last night. I wore this shirt with a little bit of purple and blue thinking that it would be the colors of the victors, but alas, it's just orange and burgundy, I don't even know what you call crimson. Not colors I was expecting, but, but for all it's worth, our Tigers did pretty good, right? Well, we talked about, you might hear sometimes this statement, an unstoppable force meaning an immovable object. When you think about that, you probably think of some great cataclysmic smash of these two forces coming together and you expect them to go flying in two different, two different directions. Well, I watched a very, very riveting lecture from a theoretical physicist. His name is Dr. Christopher Caxor. I probably butchered his name. I apologize for that if he ever goes to watch this. But his theory is that there would not be any sort of contact at all, but actually that they would phase through each other. There would be no contact whatsoever. And with that in mind, I want you to frame this for yourself. Think about God as an unstoppable force. That's not that hard for us to imagine. But then the other side, think of yourself as an immovable object. Think about, more specifically, comfortable Christianity. Because when we think about comfortable Christianity, First off, it's a self-contradiction. That's not a, that's no such thing as a comfortable Christian. You're not called to comfort, right? Well, I, uh, I did a little bit more research on contradictions and just where that word actually comes from. 
my friend uh, Charlie from Southern West University, so several of you might have met him before if you've ever been to the campus, he told me that the origin of the word contradicts comes from the Chinese word Mao Duin, literally translates to spear and shield. And it came from this old myth of this warrior that had the, an impenetrable shield and this spear that could pierce through any armor, any shield. And they asked him, well, what would happen if they were to meet? And they never figured it out. And I, I, as the myth goes, the warrior did that and it destroyed everything and it destroyed the world. And that's part of this myth, just this whole mythos, this legend. But again, based on the theoretical physics, an unstoppable force and an immovable object would just simply face through each other. And again, if we're going to frame that in the way that God is an unstoppable force, and you, or we as a church, or we as people, are immovable objects, our hearts are hardened, we're going to face through each other. There's going to be no contact whatsoever, there's going to be no impact left by our interactions with God. And with that in mind, I'm going to pray for us and we'll continue on. Okay? Lord, we want to thank you so very much for today. We thank you for these lovely people that are committed enough to brave the rain and sleep and just the nasty weather. Lord, I ask that you would bless this time, that it would be a time of refinement, that we would be challenged by you and your word, and Lord, that we would leave this place, change people. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Now, when I say the word unity, there are probably several things that come to your mind. You may think about a football team. Sometimes football teams can be described as moving as a single unit. Or you think about an orchestra where you have violins and cellos and horns and timpani drums and cymbals or the viola. I say that. Some people probably don't even know what a viola is. Well, I play the viola, so if you don't, I'm coming after you. But a viola, um, all these different things, uh, the orchestra comes together and creates this beautiful piece of music. It's emotionally stirring, it's artful, it's wonderful. You may think about an army. You may think about the old revolutionary soldiers that would get those old school muskets, they put the powder down in, they'd, they'd load the bullet, they'd cork it, everything, they'd line up in a single line, and they would say, ready, aim, fire, right? And they'd take out armies just like that, and they just keep doing that after time and time and time again. Well, when you think about unity, though, how often do you think about the church? We, you know, sometimes we can think about a church that has unity, we think about a church that is unified, and we expect that to be a church that is impacted by our community, we think about it as a church that's genuinely bringing the gospel to people. Well, for us, let's make it more personal. For welcome, what can we be unified in? I thought of three things that we could potentially rate ourselves and measure ourselves into, to our unity. And we think about Pastor Josh. Yes, he preaches between both services, so there's some unity there. But we can't be unified only on Josh, right? If we're only unified in him, and we're only basing our theology on him, well, that's just not good. That's a cult. Um, if we... Well, are we unified in our worship styles? Obviously not. We have two styles dedicated to two different styles of traditional contemporary. That's not a problem. That's not a critique. But it's just a simple fact. We don't have the same worship style across both services. If we think about what our ultimate goal is as a church, are we diverse? Are we well represented in our generations? When Josh and I were first talking about what I would preach on this morning, we considered the possibility of me talking about why my generation is not as present in the church. And we're going to touch on that a little bit, but that's not going to be the focus today. But again, that's not, that's not something that we really have as a church. And that's not just a problem here at Welcome. That's a problem in a lot of churches. My generation just simply is not present. And I can't attest as to why for everybody, but I know a lot of them, it comes from a selfish desire that they don't feel good about it, they don't feel right about it, so they just don't do anything with it. But like I said, we're not, we're not going to focus on that. The focus today, though, is going to be on unity. But more specifically, how it begins with you. And that's a pun, but unity does begin with you. Unity is a choice that you make, that you have to make every single day. And so we're going to dive back into that scripture, um, John 17, in just a minute. But first we're going to talk about expectations, specifically. Bad expectations and good expectations. It's more fun to talk about bad expectations, so we're going to start there. I, I can think of three really big bad expectations you can have as a Christian. First of, the, first of them being, God wants you to be comfortable. Now again, that's a self-contradiction. There's no such thing as a comfortable Christian. We're not here so that we can just sit back and go, ah, that's not what we're here for, right? We're here to be changed. We're here to be transformed. Another one would be something that God doesn't want the church to progress. He doesn't want the church to move forward. 
that's just simply not true. That's what the church is built upon. The church is built upon generations that are holding this baton, if you will. They're passing it to the next generation, and they let go. The next generation takes it, and they do the same thing to the next generation. That's how the church has grown. That's how it continues to grow. That's how it will continue to grow. But the last awful expectation I can think of is that God doesn't want to transform you. And now, where, where is that rooted in? Where can that come from? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with our identity, first of all. We have this sense of ourselves that we think we're too sinful. We're too just covered in sin. We can't do anything for God. That's simply not true. Now, yes, sin is a problem. We're not going to talk about sin as though it's not a problem. However, sin is not the thing that gets the final say. Amen? If we were all judged by our sins, we would not be going to a place where we could share God's glory. As we're going to read later on, that's not the case. Jesus' intention is that we would be with Him in glory, and that we would have a say in our own lives about what we are living for. So, those are the bad expectations. What are the good expectations? The good expectation you can have, I think it really just boils down to two. First off, you are in a constant state of growth. Time keeps going no matter what, right? Some of you are really begrudging about that, and you're like, well, I don't want to get any older. I'm kind of with you. I'm like, I'm 22 years old, but it's such an obscure age. Like, it just gets worse from here, right? That's what I keep hearing from people. Like, what am, I, what am I supposed to look forward to? Well, time continues to happen. It continues to move. In the same way as Christians, we have to be constantly growing. If we're not, well, we're just not living up to what God has for us. We're going to talk about that a little later on as well. Most of all, though, God wants us as a church and just as individuals to be salt and light to the world. He says that later on in some of his other Gospels, but specifically he tells us to be salt and light. And when you think about salt, if you're like me, you start to salivate a little bit because you look back at this week and you ate way too much. You had way too much fun with your family and friends and loved ones. But salt, it's not that it looks pretty. Salt isn't meant to look pretty. Salt is to make food taste better. Salt is something that enhances the flavor of something. And in the same way, God is doing that for us on an individual level. But by that same token, we, are, as Christians, are expected to then go out into the world and make people's lives enhanced by God. In the same way with light, that makes a lot of sense. If it were dark in here, there were no light. You wouldn't know who was up here. You wouldn't know anything right now. It would just be weird. We'd all be sitting in the dark. Why are we doing that? But, again, with light, it provides guidance. It gives you a way to see what is around you. When you think about a light, you probably think about a lighthouse. I think about a lighthouse is a lot when you think about a light. But, while the church is called to be a city upon a hill, how much more valuable would it be if you were to think about those ships out in the seas, all those rocks, all the, the threats that are there that can just crash them and destroy them, how much more valuable would it be if there were people in little boats, even along the way, guiding them, little lanterns? It would be pretty cool if I were to see something like that. It reminds me of something like a Van Gogh painting, his really famous one, Starry Night. It looked like something like that. That would just be beautiful if Christians were living up to that standard. And so, again, that covers more or less our expectations. Now, with that in mind, we want to talk about unity. We want to talk about it in a way that Christ talks about it. And so, kind of give a little bit more of the context, but I'm going to give you a little bit more. So, at this point in, in Jesus' life, he's already had the Passover meal with his disciples. He's already told them his purpose. We learned about last week and all through the Advent season. He came to, as a baby. And while that's beautiful and romantic and it's wonderful for us to look at, and we can have all these wonderful nativity sets up, some of you probably still do have it set up at home. That's not God's ultimate purpose. His purpose was not to stay as a baby. It's not so he could be this triumphant king that rides on a war horse. No. He came to the world to get dirty, to love people well, and to ultimately bring them into the kingdom of heaven. And so, with that in mind, he told them again, the body, his bread, or the bread being his body, and the wine being his blood that's going to be poured out and broken and shed for them, and so we move forward into the Garden of Gethsemane where he has been praying, literally praying to the point where he's having sweats of blood. I don't know about you, I've never sweated like that. Sometimes I feel like it in the humidity here in the summers, but it's never been that bad. But ultimately he's praying and praying and he gets to the point where he says, Lord, take this cup from me. It's not my will but thine. And so we read on here in verse 17 through 26. He talked about it a lot. We're going to recap it in just a moment, but let's read through it first. He says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. 
For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 23, I am them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. I want you to catch that, complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory and the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Now there's a lot to unpack with that. First off, we talk about sanctification. That's how he prefaces it in, first, in verse 17. Sanctification is a really big way of saying, how can we love God well with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love others as we would like to be loved? That's ultimately what sanctification means. Jesus is not thinking for himself, though, ultimately, from the beginning. He's not putting himself in a position where he's, like, running for the hills. Now, again, if I were in Jesus' shoes, and I'm thinking about, man, I'm going to have to take on all the sins of the world. I have to go be crucified for all this. I don't even know if these people are worth it, man. I don't know if this is worth it. I would be running for the hills. But again, by his conviction, by the love that he has for us, including you and me now, because this is not just a prayer for his disciples. This is a prayer for you and I. He is bound by love. And he's going to go through with it. He's going to be crucified. With that in mind, he lowers himself, he humbles himself, and he is thinking about you and me. He's praying not only just that we would be saved, that we would share in his glory, but more specifically, he talks about that he wants us to be the ones that would bring the message of reconciliation. Verse 20 he says that my prayer is not for them alone, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So, immediately, he's not even just thinking about you and me anymore. He's already moved past us. He's already thinking about the people that aren't even here in this room yet. Wow, that's a big prayer, right? Well, it's Jesus. Of course he has a big prayer. But this idea of complete unity that I told you to remember, it's in verse 23. Complete unity. Now, again, there are lots of things that can probably come to mind with that. And I ultimately think it, it harkens back to sanctification. What sanctification is going to look like for you. Again, sanctification is a really big way of just saying, love God, love others. But, that's really just way too simple, isn't it? Because life is crazy, life is awkward, and sometimes there's just hard things that you have to do, hard things that have to be said, and there are hard decisions that you have to make. Well, sanctification doesn't have to be that complicated. It's only as complicated as you make it. So, if we're dedicated to loving God and loving others with all of our heart, soul, and strength, Sanctification becomes possible. So with that in mind, we're going to jump to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-8. through It'll be on the screen, so if you read through that with me. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may, be, you may participate in the divine nature. Simply just meaning, to live holy lives having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, again, just holiness, and to holiness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that's a big part there to remember, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's a really, really simple task list, more or less. But that's not how we're supposed to approach it, unfortunately. A lot of you guys are typing, like, okay, I got my checklist, I got all my systems, I got all my schedules, everything's just perfect, I can measure it out equally. That's not how it's going to work, guys. That's not how sanctification works. I would challenge you, instead of thinking about it as a cycle where you check that mark off, check that mark off, check that one off, think of it more as a cycle. Because who can attest, I'm sure all of us can, loving somebody sometimes requires a lot of faith. Because loving somebody can be really hard. That's just the truth. So that being said, being nice, being smart, being disciplined, being self-controlled, 
all those things, they're not enough on their own. It all has to be cyclable. It has to be something that continues and continues. That's why I said, remember, to keep, to keep account of that, that statement in verse 8 where it says, to keep those qualities in increasing measure. It can't just be something that we do at one point and we mark off. We're good. We never have to worry about being self-controlled ever again. That's not how sin works, right? Obviously not. So, that being said, though, what are we supposed to do with those things that do keep just coming up? Well, approach it on a level where every single day you're saying to yourself, how, Lord, can I serve you? How can I be an instrument for you? How can I be an instrument of your gospel? How can I love this person better? How can I love my parents better? Those are sorts of questions that you need to ask yourself. And then, in turn, to begin acting upon those things. Now, Again, sanctification and holiness are not just going to happen overnight. You're not just going to wake up and say one day, well, I'm holy. Hope everybody's ready. No, that would be really weird. And everybody would look at you and be like, go away. But no, therefore, this is coming from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. This is a promise um, that, that, P, excuse me, that Paul is writing to us about. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Holiness and perfection, which again, I use that term loosely, I'm not expecting you to be perfect. That's not what God has. That's an intention. That's a goal. But perfection is really more about how we approach each thing that we come across our day. Because the, the default always, of course, is, well, when something bad happens or something sad happens, we react. We just jump. We don't think about it. We just simply do it, whatever it is. I think sometimes we complicate ourselves and our relationship with God because we want to react. We don't want to respond. Just take a half second to think about what we're going to do, what we're going to say, how we're going to feel. Ultimately, a lot of our life is gauged upon how we're going to respond to them. Because if it's all just reactions, you're going to live a crazy life. I've tried that. We've probably all tried that at some point, right? But it doesn't work out very well, typically. C.S. Lewis writes in The Weight of Glory something I find really, really profound. And it's, it's really been convicting to me um, over the, por the portion of this, this month or so, um, leading up to now and through this new year and through Christmas. He writes, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition and infinite joy is offered to us. And like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slime because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. That all harkens back to our expectations. Sometimes our expectations are too low for God. I'm just as guilty of that. Sometimes I look at my life and I'm like, man, God, how in the world can you be transforming me in this area of my life? I failed a lot in this. I said a lot of mean things to those people. I've done a lot of things that I shouldn't have done. I've done I haven't done enough of the things I should have been doing. All those sorts of questions can come up and they walk us into a place of guilt and shame. And I'm here to tell you this first off, that is not of God. Guilt, sure. Be convicted of things, but don't sit in your guilt and your shame wondering if you can get out. That question has already been answered for you. And it came through the sanctification, through salvation brought to us by Jesus. He saved us. But you have to be willing enough to ask God for big, big prayers. If you're not being scared about what you're asking God for, you're probably not asking enough. This is what it boils down to. And so... Why am I even talking about this? Why are we talking about this today? In the, in the weeks leading up to, um, or excuse me, the weeks following this, this week, we're going to go through a series with Pastor Josh about discipleship. And discipleship, yes, has a lot to do with how you and I interact with each other. And sanctification does too. However, I think before we can move forward into a true discipleship-focused series, we have to be able to look at our lives and see what we need to be able to do in our own hearts first. I think that's just how it has to happen first. If we're not willing, we can't lead our families better. We can't lead our brothers and sisters any better than we're leading ourselves. But the point is, of sanctification, the purpose is not so that we would be able to look at our lives and see, well, yeah, I'm measuring up a lot better in these places. I'm doing a lot better in this thing. No, the purpose of sanctification is that we would invest into each other and see what is going on, and not just look at them from a distance. 
See, we come at a place where we like welcome, and we live up to our name. We do welcome people very well. But I'm going to tattle on some of you guys a little bit. Kyle and I graduated back in May, and we've had people ask us how our breaks have been. Like, how, you know, have we enjoyed school? I'm like, did you miss that? <laughs> like, stuff like that. Like, the, and I'm just as guilty of that. I'm not accusing anybody more than so than myself. There are definitely things in your lives that I have no idea what's going on. And I apologize for that. As your brother in Christ, I want to be better. I want to love you better in those ways that I can actually be investing in your life and encouraging you, praying for you, those sorts of things. But sanctification, just on a very tangible level, looks a lot more like you just caring about people more. And that has to come from a place of you saying, well, yes, I'm going to love God. I'm also going to love people. Like we said, with that being the, the general definition of sanctification and what holiness looks like, you can't do one or the other. As much as we would like just to just mark it off the list, say, yep, I love God with all my heart today, and love him with all my soul tomorrow, and my mind later, all those sorts of things, you can't just do that. You can't also just do that apart from loving others. It's one and the same. I can't love you unless I fully understand the depths of God's love for me. And you certainly can't love God. I can't certainly love God if I'm not loving you well either. That's just how it works. But the truth, again, is sanctification isn't going to happen all at once. It's not something that you're just going to wake up and I'm holy and let's go attack the world. No, that's not the point. I'm not asking you to be this crazy radical. No, I'm asking you to be the true believer that lives up to the calling that God has for you. That's all it is. That sounds intimidating, but really it's not. He wants you to be in the moment. He wants you to be devoted to people. He wants you to be concerned for people. And he wants you to see how you can be someone that enhances their life in a way that's redemptive and brings to them the image of God that is supposed to be in them. Because we're all called to holiness. That's a true fact of the Bible. We're called to more than just simply living life with the knowledge that, yay, we're saved! If that were the case, why would we even be in this room? That's not the point. The point, again, is that we would continue to live in relationship with Christ and then also in turn in relationship with each other. And so we titled this sermon, War. And I wanted to do that a little bit as just to like, oh, what are we talking about today? But I want it to be as simple as us making war on the status quo. What the status quo looks like for you is going to vary from what it looks like to me. That's just a matter of fact. But we can all be challenging that. We can all be fighting for something. And ultimately, what we have today is a choice. Are we going to fight for what we believe? Are we going to fight for what we know God can do in us? Or are we going to be immovable objects? Are we going to be people that just simply let God pass us by? Obviously, that's not the choice we can make. That's not something we can continue to live in. If you're in a place where you don't know in your faith how you can continue growing, you kind of sputtered out and you've kind of plateaued, look for something new. Very practical things. Tech booth, children's ministry, youth ministry, hospitality team, I don't care, whatever it is, just own it. Challenge yourself. More challenging thing, go to the other service. A part of us living in relationship with each other is pursuing each other with intentionality. That doesn't mean that you always have to just always go to the first service, but, you know, every now and then, go up there. Come up here early. Get here 30 minutes early. Have conversations with people from the first service. That same challenge has been given to them. We want to be a church that is not just saying we're living in community and welcoming each other. We really want to be a church that is embracing each other amongst all the craziness and confusion and just life that happens, right? That's what church is supposed to be. And so again, the challenge today is to make war for that. Make war on the status quo. Live for holiness. Because ultimately, a truly unified church, full of completely whole people, sanctified holy people, what it means to be in complete unity, again, is to love God well and to love others well. A church that is built up of people like that is both an unstoppable force and a new world object. And that's what we want to be, right? There are lots of things we can be thinking about with our community right now. We think about all the politics and how big of a fiasco it was this past year. Um, there's a, a YouTuber that described 2016 as the dumpster fire of a year. Literally just setting trash on fire and just enjoying that wonderful smell, right? That's how 2016 was. Let's just be honest. It was a hard year. 
Turn 17 is day one. It's a blank slate. And we have an opportunity to live for something more than just another dumpster fire of a year, for lack of a better term. I'm just as challenged by this as anyone else, and I, I want to be better in myself as well. And I hope you'll continue to uh, pursue that. Um, so we're going to pray, um, and we're going to continue. Lord, we want to thank you so very much for today. We thank you for everybody in this room. We thank you for your word, and that it is truth, and we can bank on that. Lord, we ask that you would continue to remind us of how we can grow, that you would challenge us and transform us. Lord, help us to pray bold prayers, that we would ask a lot of you and expect a lot from ourselves. Help us not to be stuck in a rut, and not to feel like that we are. Lord, we love you so, so very much. Help us to remember what you did for us, that you did not die for us and give your glory to us so that we would just sit on it and be comfortable. Help us to be mindful of the people around us, that we would love them well, we'd be concerned for them and concerned for their life. Lord, you're a good God and we believe that you are coming back and that you will take us with you and that you will have us in your kingdom, Lord. That's your desire. Help us to bring more people with us. We love you, Lord. We praise you again for everything today. Help it be edifying to you and your work in your name. Amen. Um, that's all we've got for you today, guys. But by way of announcements, I do want to add at the very end, um, you should have seen little white communication cards. If any of you guys are visiting today, we'd love for you to fill that out. And we would love to send you home with a gift. Feel free to stop by the Welcome Center here to your right. Um, we can have a conversation and send you home with your gift. Um, on top of that, I guess the only other announcement is that we will have uh, connection group signups coming up here very, very soon um, in, in relationship and partnership with this new series we're going to be doing. So I would uh, just remind you, be thinking about a connection group, what day works best for you, um, and we will continue on. Love you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.